Good afternoon. My name is Jake Berkeley. I've been involved with SMART for a little over four years, and I've been a facilitator for open meetings in Tucson, Arizona for three years. I'm very excited and humbled to be speaking to you all today. I would like to start by recognizing Noni Sims and Susan McGinnis and Mark Janis from the Tucson SMART Facilitator Team and the Planning Committee for making this conference possible. I'd also like to thank SMART for the things that it has given to me. Sobriety, a life full of self-worth, gratitude, balance, mindfulness, and a clear head. I know it sounds like a lot, but truly, SMART has given all of this to me. Just a few years ago, who I was and who I wanted to be were not alike. My aspirations in life far exceeded my abilities. My life was plagued by overwhelming failures and a feeling of worthlessness. My key to happiness was substance abuse, although that happiness was fleeting. Naturally, this led to more reckless behavior, and I nearly ruined my life beyond all repair when I got my third DUI. Yes, I did just say my third DUI. I was informed that I was likely to go to prison for five years. Now, at the time, I had a good job and I was successful. I had a family that genuinely cared for me and I genuinely cared about them. And I thought only bad people to go to prison and I didn't consider myself to be a bad person. So when I got that third DUI, it shook me to the core. Although it probably shouldn't have, I knew the consequences and I realized that I was in a state of arrested development. I knew that something had to change and that something was me. My parents encouraged me to go to a 12-step meeting, and I attended one a week after my arrest. I sat through it, and I listened, but I didn't feel as though I related to anyone there. In fact, I didn't feel any relief at all, but I still wanted help. So I did what any reasonable person would do, a Google search. Huh? And I came across the Spark program, and it just so happened that there was a meeting a few minutes away from my house. When I went to that very first meeting, I realized that I had found the SMART program, well, the, the support group that I was looking for, and that was SMART. Noni Sims was facilitating that meeting that I went to, and she created a relaxed atmosphere that helped everyone open up without shame. Noni and I grew close over some time, and here a complete stranger was eager to be vested in me. She encouraged me to take action in my life and wanted to be a part of it. I was touched that this woman was doing everything she could to guide me. She was genuine in her kind-heartedness, and I think that is what helped me find my encounter. It inspired me to help others going through life with that same feeling of constant failure and self-sabotage. I was ashamed of where I was in my life, and I realized that that's a hard thing to talk about. My connection with people is a reflection of what Noni provided me. I do my best to convey the revelation to my own recovery, as well as spending a lot of time allowing people to share with me and helping them find the right path. Facilitating for me has been the maintenance in my recovery that I need. Knowing that people have been sober for years and that discussions in our meeting have a huge impact on our lives in a very positive way inspires me each and every week. It tells me that I'm on the right track. Recovery can be extremely overwhelming, and life changes don't happen overnight. It takes time and diligence in creating attainable goals so that we don't get discouraged. As our goals are reached, we achieve confidence in our success, and in turn, we gain confidence, and we succeed more rapidly and more frequently. I tell people in my meetings all the time that recovery is a scientific process. We must experiment to find what works for each of us, because our recovery may look vastly different than anyone else's. What the initial SMART meetings I attended gave me was a catalyst to realize that I had the power to manage my thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. My father encouraged me to find self-worth in an exercise of gratitude. He told me to say out loud what I was grateful for every night before I went to bed. 
I real didn't realize it at the time, but he was helping me find a hierarchy of values. I believe that establishing values provides us with the foundation on which to build our recovery. Part of my foundation was giving back through SMART. I was ordered by the courts to do 50 hours of community service, and Noni was adamant in wanting me to establish. I'm sorry, Noni was adamant in wanting to help me complete this. At the time, SMART was not established through the courts in Arizona as an accredited organization to do community service work. Noni wrote, wrote many letters to a judge requesting that I be able to fill my service through SMART Recovery and manage to get it approved. I should say that. Sherry Allwood was also very helpful during this process. Little did I know that this course of events would give SMART and the Pima County Court System the ability to work hand in hand, allowing all people to achieve their court mandated community service through our organization. The importance that I found in this connection is that a lot of the time, people don't seek out assistance in recovery until they are forced to. By opening up our meetings to people trying to fulfill a legal obligation, we are able to introduce them to a lifestyle that they probably wouldn't have found otherwise. I encourage everyone here to contact their county and city court systems and ask them to support SMART through their probation and rehabilitation programs. You never know whose life you might influence and the profound impact SMART will have on them. If you want to grow your meetings, please reach out to them and give them the foot in the door that they need. I believe that it is because of the supportive push from Noni, and arguably my legal obligations, that I ultimately became a facilitator. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for Noni and Kent, I wouldn't be standing before you today. Up until about 10 years ago, Tucson only had closed smart meetings. Noni and Kent wanted, to, wanted an open meeting in Tucson, and they decided that they were going to be the ones to open. They got in touch with the local church and carried on with the meeting for months on end, paying rent, just the two of them sitting across from each other every Thursday night, <laughs> knowing that persistence would pay off. This was the open meeting that I was so fortunate to find in my Google search. This is the open meeting that changed my life, our flagship Thursday meeting. The following summer, Noni had a surgery and Kelly, was one of our peers, chose to step up and help out. I was working on my certification in the time and was worried about how well I was going to handle leading a meeting by myself. However, watching Kelly facilitate with such confidence inspired me to be able to do the same. I was learning how to turn my life lessons into constructive ways to help people in the recovery through the use of smart techniques and personal growth. She taught me how to facilitate as a peer. By the end of the summer, once again, I had completed my certification and began to facilitate this meeting as well. With three facilitators now available, we realized that we had the resources to open up more meetings. In 2016, once again, Noni and Kent set out to find another meeting location. They found Bridges Counseling, who were gracious enough to give us meeting time on Saturday afternoons. I started that meeting in February of that year, providing Tucson with a weekend meeting for those whose weekday schedules were too high. Bridges was so pleased by the outcome of our Saturday meeting that they wanted us to please open up another meeting and make it available at another Bridges location. And after a few short months, Noni had opened up our Tuesday meeting. We now have three meetings with three active facilitators, and we felt as though we were headed in a positive direction. These meetings were very successful. However, a year later, Kelly took a great job and was no longer available to continue facilitating. So we reached out to the members of our group and we acquired Jim, Susan, and Mark as host facilitators. In the fall of 2017, we felt comfortable again with the growth of more, sorry, the idea of more growth. Ken spoke with National Health Care Center about using their facility, which is now the home of our Friday meeting. Our attendance has fluctuated a bit. 
but we noticed a steady growth of bread makers. We have created a community in Tucson, not through publicity, but by consistent actions and word of mouth. I am proud to inform you all that we are currently in the process of getting a fifth meeting started in Moravia. <coughs> what I essentially want you to get out of this history is the value of persistence persistence and the importance of determination in our mission to Swarm of Tucson. We are well on our way of having a meeting for every day of the week. When I started my meetings, I wanted it to be based more on the study of how SMART works. I always begin with a structured check-in, having them start out with their successes, followed by their setbacks and lessons learned from those setbacks, and concluding with upcoming challenges. I believe this sets up people psychologically to rest, recognize the positives in the recovery, understanding that every so-called setback is just a lesson to be learned, and this provides us with clarification on what needs to be focused on in the upcoming week. After check-ins, I will usually try to identify a tool to be addressed. For instance, when I see an overriding theme of people struggling with urges, I bring up an urge log or a vacuum list and how it works to divert the irrational thought and give them something constructive and creative to work with. When our lives are in turmoil, our thoughts can nearly drown us. Often I will hear that they know the material, but they don't know how and when to pick up the tools and use the knowledge to help themselves in a time of need. I have found in my meetings to increase participation and understanding of a tool that doing a study on a whiteboard is incredibly helpful. Deconstructing the tools and techniques of Smart Recovery Platform and walking them through shows people how, why, and where to utilize them in their own recovery and day-to-day -day life. What I have heard in my check-ins are people remembering the exercises and are better able to access the information after a long-form discussion. I think that it is important for people to acknowledge their problems, but then use our time together to refocus on how to overcome them. Our goal is to get people to self-manage and successfully rehabilitate themselves through recovery. I feel so blessed that Smart Recovery has been a part of my life, both when I greatly needed it and when I needed to give back through it. I am very happy with our accomplishments in Tucson and look forward to much more. And again, a huge thank you to the Smart Facilitator team in Tucson, Noni, Jim, Mark, Susan, and of course, Kent, for helping create open meetings in SMART of Tucson, and for giving me the pleasure of being here with you all today. Thank you.
mean, no one is going to come after you if you sneak into a different topic, but <laughs> the idea was to try to figure out what size rooms things should be in. And the hosts or the co-hosts are essentially going to do the same topic twice in a row, but things which are discussed may vary greatly depending on who shows up in the room each time. So I hope that sort of makes sense. All right. Um, the room list will, will be available after lunch. I'm, I'm going to review it real quickly during lunch because there were some changes um, and they're all in this conference center. Excuse me. They're all in this conference center. So I'll review the room list over lunch just because there were changes. Basically, it's going to be all down the hall. There will be three in this room and two in the lunch room, which is the next ball. <laughs> You guys hear me? Great. You know that just myself standing between you guys at lunch, so I'll be sure to <laughs> take as much time as I possibly can muster up for you guys. Um, first of all, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, Smart has been a great uh, tool for me, a great opportunity. Um, again, my name is Ryan, Ryan Johnson, and as I like to party, I love to party. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, I wouldn't be here. Um, my journey has been long. 
I've always tried to achieve uh, lofty goals. I always knew that I could probably be anything that I wanted to as long as I set my mind to it. But I also figured that, you know, I could, I could live two lives. I could live this double life. I could party. I could do what I want. I could get high. I could get drunk. I could also go to class. I could also get A's in school. I could also do what I need to do. I could hold down a job. I could take care of my family. It was this double life, this double A's score that I kept living on and on, year after year after year, that brought me to that jail cell five years ago uh, in the city of Scottsdale. It wasn't even until then where I realized and thought that I had a problem. I said to myself, why is this happening to me? How could this happen to me? I decided to go back to school. I didn't even have a bachelor's degree, but I decided I wanted to go to law school. I had to go back, I had to finish my undergrad, I had to go straight to law school, I was part-time, went to school at night, worked all day. I put in some serious hours in order to be able to do what I want to do to help my community, but why is this happening to me? I couldn't figure it out. It wasn't until about a couple of, about a few years later, maybe four years later, that I realized that it's not necessarily that it happened to me, but it happened for it gave me the opportunity to realize that there's a problem. Now back to the character and fitness thing. So after I graduated law school, I'm still rationalizing this in my head. I can talk to some ladies. It's not so bad. Drug for lines, carrying them for a friend. You know, that sounds reasonable enough, right? So I'm filling out the application for my character and fitness, and when you apply to become an attorney, you have to list everything you've ever done in your entire life. I'm talking about way back to middle school, even elementary school. So even I had to tell about Miss Moody's note that she sent home in second grade that I had to forge uh, and ended up getting in trouble for it. They don't really care that you have done these things because, let's face it, we've all done things in our lives. They just want to know that you're honest and open and upfront about it. However, as I started to fill out this form and I was going through the research and I had to do some research to, to document everything I've ever done, I noticed that every time I've ever been arrested or in trouble with the law, it is always centered around drugs and alcohol. I've probably have been arrested more than eight times in my life. Each and every time, minor in possession, open and toxic, open and toxic in public, open and toxic in car, possession of marijuana, use of marijuana. Every single one centered around drug use. Every single encounter I've ever had with the police centered around drug use or alcohol use. Now, it hit me. At this point, I'm graduated from law school. I'm on my way to, to, to undertake this, this massive undertaking, applying for the bar, applying for character of fitness, when I realized something is going on here. Yeah, I'm a smart guy. I knew I was smart. I graduated, top of my class. I did this, I did that. But I still was not smart enough to realize that I had a problem. I said, something's going on here. You know, I pick up on patterns pretty easily, but I never picked up on this pattern until now that when I drink, I make bad decisions. So it was at that point well, I reached out to a substance abuse counselor and started going to substance abuse counseling. Uh, this particular counselor recommended Smart Recovery. I'd never heard of it before in my life. I went. First time I went was on New Year's Eve of 2013 to 2014. There was not a meeting that day. I think I called Anna on the phone. She said, I'm sorry. It probably would be a good idea to have a meeting on New Year's Eve, but we're not, actually. That's <laughs> understandable, people probably don't show up. However, I went to the next one, I went to the next one, I went to the next one. I kept going. It's been about five years since then. See, the thing I like about SMART is it's a cognitive based recovery. See, I knew that I was a smart person. And I knew that, hey, I should be able to figure this out. Something's going on here. There has to be something else besides the fact that I'm powerless over somebody else's deity, that I'm powerless over my addiction, over my problems, without uh, some type of religious interference. And don't get me wrong, I have nothing against religion. I'm a religious I'm a spiritual person myself. I just knew that there was something else at play here. It was then where I started to realize the bad and poor decision-making skills that I've had. It was then that I decided and I realized that I was not able or able or capable at that point or even recognize some of the tools that were available. Tools like cost benefit analysis, right? Balancing tests. See, these are all tools that we use for success, everyday success in life. Whether we're buying a car, whether we're deciding to get married, whether we're deciding to buy a house, whatever. 
we use these tools, but we don't, or at least I haven't, used these sort of tools when it comes to making these poor, poor decisions in my life. Once I was able to use these tools, I started to realize, okay, I get it, I got it, I can do this. See, my, my theory of success in life comes with the three Ds, it's called a decision first, dedication, and discipline. First, you have to make the decision to either become sober, make the decision that you want to lose weight, make the decision that you want to stop smoking, whatever it is, you just have to make the decision, and once you make the decision, you, you essentially cut off any other, other avenue. Dedication comes in where you have to stick with it. Yeah, it gets tough. Yeah, I'm out partying, I'm hanging out with my friends, and everybody's drinking, and sure, one drink won't matter. Surely I can handle one drink now. Discipline. Now, I can't. Because I'm not the type of person who just drinks one drink. I don't care if it's a glass of water. I will not have just one glass. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. I'm a thirsty person by nature. I don't care if it's milk. I drink a lot. <laughs> So beer, alcohol, whatever, whatever it is, I am a consumer. I, do, I believe in doing things big. I told you I like to party. And whatever I do, I, I decide to do it big. But the point that I'm trying to make, ladies and gentlemen, is that you guys are going to something this much. And I caught briefly the gentleman uh, speaking out about the growth that Smart is starting to experience. And I think a lot of people feel, like myself, something's going on here. We can figure this out, I just need some help. And as long as other people are there to help you along the way and to be able to share similar stories, I think that we may be able to, to at least get on the path of solving these problems that we have. Addiction is a problem for all of us, no, no matter what it is. See, my addiction, I equate it to like that game of whack a mole As soon as you hit one, it pops up at another. You stop drinking. Stop smoking weed, stop doing drugs. Oh, I like to eat. I'm a foodie now. <laughs> I love gourmet food. I love to see up the restaurants. Blew up like a balloon. I got up to 330 pounds. I had to work through that. I'm about 105 or so pounds lighter after that, trying to live a healthier lifestyle. Where is this whack and over? Is it going to pop up next in my life? Fortunately, well, unfortunately, I do smoke cigars from time to time. Probably, I wouldn't say time to time, probably more often than I should. Um, but fortunately for me, I'm at the point now where I'm into healthy addictions. I love to work out. I love weight training. I love uh, eating healthy. I love taking care of my body. It's the only one that we have. It's the only one that we're blessed with. It's the only vessel that we have to take us throughout this journey called life. And we must take care of it. So, I always say that to say this, that tackling addictions is hard, hard. I think we all probably know what it would be. But you have to have the discipline and the fortitude to be able to see it through. You have to envision who you want to be, who you see yourself as later on in life. I saw myself as a successful person. I said, hell, George Bush stopped smoking, stopped snorting cocaine, and stopped drinking at 40, and he became the president. He can do it. Surely I can do it too. I may not want to become the president, but I may want to do some other things in life. And I know that in order to be able to do that, I need to be on my P's and Q's, as they call it, at all times. See, what I love the most about being sober is being able to think clearly all the time. I was speaking with a gentleman in a coffee shop. I overheard him tell someone else that he had five years of sobriety. And, uh, you know, I try not to be a generally nosy person, but when I hear sobriety, my ears pick up. Because I'm on that path as well. I congratulated him, you know, after he stopped talking to the person he was, he was conversating with. I said, congratulations, sir. I, you know, I really applaud you that I'm five years into it myself. He said, you know what I love the most about being sober? I said, what? I like just being able to experience life fully. I like being in charge and in control of all of my sensories. Being able to smell, see, hear, touch, feel. All of us. And I'm in the same boat. I love speaking, I love talking to people, I love people, I love helping, I love to help them make a difference. But most importantly, I love myself. You have to love yourself enough to know that you are worth being your best you 
If you can't sell you to you, you can't sell you to anybody else. Why should I believe you if you don't believe you? So the thing that I like what Jason talked about earlier is how he starts off his meetings with positivity. I love it. I'm an eternally positive person that try to stay that way. Sometimes in meetings we have a tendency to, you know, what was me, we'll jump on our problems, we'll say, oh, I'm having this problem, and the next person will top that person, well, damn, well, I'm having this problem. And then the next person will say, well, shit, I'm having this problem. And it gets worse. And by the time it gets to me, I try to say, you know what, I'm having a great day, I'm blessed to be alive. Any day above ground is a good day to me. And I always try to change the spirit of it. Uh, and we can't, don't get me wrong, we all go through things, and we just want to talk about it, I get it. But let's focus on what we have going for us. So, with that, my time is coming up. You guys know that it's time for lunch. Um, again, I want to thank you guys for the opportunity. I really want to thank you. She's a super awesome facilitator. She's in the back there, looking beautiful as ever. Super smart. She has shown me that I can do anything that I ever wanted to do. It's, see, it, the thing about being a smart recovery meeting in the organization is that we all believe in each other because we believe in ourselves. Hell, if, if I can do it, if I can do it, trust and believe it, I'm no superhero, you can do it. That's what Anna explained to me. She explained to each of us, and we try to explain to each other. So we have a good fight, ladies and gentlemen. I applaud you guys' effort. I applaud you guys for being here. Um, there's an army of folks out there just like you. Uh, we all love you guys.